Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. And it's my absolute pleasure to get the opportunity to tell you about some of the work that we're doing. And this is very much an, a multidisciplinary team that consists of uh, Dr. Angela Brooks, who is a computational biologist here at UCSC. And she's really an expert on cancer and this process known as splicing that I'm going to tell you about as I go through this talk. I am Susan Carpenter, and uh, my area of interest is the immune system. And we're very much interested in understanding the role that RNA plays in controlling our immune system. And myself and Angela both started our labs on the exact same day, and we were very excited to immediately start working together. And we started working on this project of trying to understand the role of this process known as splicing in our immune system. And the area that my lab very much focuses on is the processes that lead to inflammation. And I'm sure everybody in this audience is somewhat familiar with the inflammatory processes when you think of redness, heat, and swelling. Uh, it's important to also know that we need inflammation to protect us against infection, whether it's a virus or bacteria. We need the inflammatory process to kick in, but you need it to work really quickly and then shut off really, really quickly. And pro uh, problems really arise when we don't shut off the process very quickly. And what can happen is that can lead to what we know as chronic inflammation. And chronic inflammation is a central feature of every single condition you can think of, whether it's uh, cardiovascular disease, cancer, autoimmunity. All of the features that are central lead back to chronic inflammation. And that's why we're so interested in really understanding the processes that govern chronic inflammation, because if you could design better drugs to target that, you could have a massive impact on a whole host of different conditions. And so, the process we're interested in understanding is this process known as splicing. And so up on top, we're showing you the DNA. So that's essentially the blueprint of what's going to get made in cells. And your DNA gets turned into RNA. And we're showing them here as little exons and introns. The introns are the lines that get spliced out as RNA is made. So that's where the term splicing comes from. And I kind of think of it as a bit like a jigsaw puzzle, where those little uh, colored boxes have to get put together. And they can get put together in a whole a lot of different ways. And that's what gives these versions of RNA that can get made through this process known as splicing. And what myself and Angela were really interested in understanding is what's the difference in the versions of RNA that gets made if you compare healthy cells to the cells that are undergoing inflammation. And so you might think, what has this process got to do with everyday life? Um, and right now, we are all still living in a pandemic. It has not ended. Um, and um, what we know is that it's quite striking, is that 95% of our actual genes produce more than one version of an RNA. And that's relevant right now because the pandemic has been caused by the virus called SARS-CoV-2. And how it gets into our body is through a receptor known as ACE2. And it turns out that we have many versions of ACE2 that get made in our body. Again, I'm showing you here the DNA um, that it looks like this is from our own UCSC genome browser. Again, where the uh, little arrows are the bits that are going to get spliced out, and the other little boxes are what our RNA is going to be. And what's interesting is that while there, there's many versions of ACE2, an even newer version was just identified a year ago. And what's really interesting is these are very highly expressed in our lung cells. This is how the virus gets in, yet we don't know why we have all these different versions or what version is the most important for us or which has been used by the virus. So lots to learn in this space. And the area that uh, myself and Angela have decided to focus on trying to figure this out is through the use of a technology known as nanopore technology. And um, also very interesting is that nanopore technology was developed here at UC Santa Cruz by Dave Diemer and also by Mark Akison. And we work quite a lot with the Akison lab, even on this particular project. Project. And I love showing this image here on the right because this was a doodle from Dave Diemer's lab notebook on his vision in 1989 of how this pore was going to work. And so essentially it's a pore that you can pass through DNA or RNA. It's going to cause a change in the current that can then be read out by a computer. And this uh, little doodle is exactly what we use right now, which is using the technology on the left-hand side, um, that's our sequencer, that's how we read out RNA. And it's that tiny little um, device that you can hold in your hand, which is amazing. You can sequence entire genomes off of that little machine. And so, um, sorry. 
Um, this is the pipeline that um, myself and Angela have been using to study uh, splicing in the immune system. And so uh, we take cells from humans and from mice, and my lab is particularly focused on a cell type called macrophages. These, like, think of them as the patrollers that go around your body when there's an infection, they alert the rest of your immune system to get into action. So uh, they're really the ones that call out the presence of danger. So we took out macrophages, we isolated the RNA and passed that through the nanopore machine. Angela's lab perform all the computational analysis and then we find all of the versions of RNA that are in our cells. And one in particular that we're super excited about is uh, versions that we identified of a protein called AIM2. And the reason we're very excited is that this is a protein that's been studied for years and very important in our immune system. And using this technology for the first time, we identified a brand new version of this RNA. So again, showing you from the genome browser what this looks like at, um, again, our little boxes and arrows. And the new version that we identified in the bottom is a slightly longer version. And we were like, this is interesting, what, what does this mean? And so the reason we were super excited about AIM-2 is that, as I said, it's been studied for years, but this version has never been seen before. And what AIM-2 does in your immune system is that it again acts as a sensor, so it can recognize bacteria and viruses. They get into your cells, they can turn on this particular protein. This protein recognizes the DNA and kicks off inflammation. And so it plays this really central role in our immune system for controlling inflammation. And what we um, did a lot of work and were able to conclude from this uh, work is that what's happening in our cells up on top in the normal state is that you make, you see these two little arrows and you drive the protein off of one of those arrows. And so this is what's happening in normal healthy cells. You make a version of this RNA that gets then turned into that AIM2 protein. That protein lives in your cell waiting for a signal like a bacteria or virus to get in. And then what we found is that when you turn on inflammation in these cells, we're now using the, the, the earlier arrow to kick off this RNA, this new version that's the slightly longer um, five prime end tail. And what's super interesting is I show it here as like a little red circle and a little blob on top. This is the regulatory component. And what happens is that this basically signals for the protein not to be made anymore. And we think this is super interesting because I told you at the beginning, you need inflammation to turn on really quickly. You need it to turn off really quickly. And we believe we've identified a new mechanism which how this can actually happen. So that in your healthy cells on top, you're making the protein. It's ready to roll if there is an invasion. And then once it kicks off, you need to switch to the other version that's not going to make the protein to stop the signaling. And the reason we think this is super interesting is that this little regulatory ball in red is actually regulated by iron. And we know in inflammatory diseases, um, if you think of conditions like lupus, um, you can actually use iron as a biomarker uh, to diagnose the condition because you can secrete it in urine. And so there is this um, overload of iron in a number of auto-inflammatory conditions. And we can imagine that this is a problem because um, if you have an overload of iron, you're going to keep on making this protein, and so it's never going to go away. And having too much of that protein around is going to start reacting to DNA as it comes into the cell, and that, we think, is one of the fundamental problems um, with auto-inflammatory conditions. And so um, we're very excited about this particular area of research. We published this first study just last year. And we think this is so interesting because it really gets to the heart of understanding the fundamentals of inflammation. And so we've identified these two new versions of this uh, protein. Really now we're trying to dig into really understanding exactly which one does what. What's interesting is I told you about one. We identified 100 other proteins that um, are regulated in a similar manner. So we want to ask beyond AIM-2, how many of them are getting, how exactly are they being regulated? And will this really help us understand inflammatory diseases? Because as I mentioned, if we can design better, more targeted drugs, we can have an impact on a whole host of diseases. And so right now we're in the getting funding to expand this study as well as recruit new students. Um, obviously, I'd like to thank uh, the Brooks Lab, who is my partner in this, as well as the Akinson Lab that we do a lot of our sequencing with. We've started doing sequencing with the Vollmer's Lab on conditions like lupus to really better understand and also inflammatory conditions. 
our funding sources, and uh, please reach out to us if you have any questions or comments. And I'm happy to take questions. <laughs>